Good morning from the Morrison Hotel and from Pensions Awareness Week. Um, this talk is going to be on approaching retirement for the executive. Um, I am joined today here by three very esteemed gentlemen in the uh, pensions uh, industry. Um, I, to my left here, I have Declan Allen from Allen Retirement and Finance. Um, in the centre, we have Paul Kenny, who I'm sure you all might know, who's been on television and media throughout the last three, four decades in Ireland uh, from the Retirement Council of Ireland. And uh, last but not least, we have Mark Riley from Royal London of Ireland. Gentlemen, would you mind just explaining very briefly what, what, what's your relevance to the, to the pensions industry in Ireland? We'll start with yourself. Well, Please. thank you very much, Liz. Uh, delighted to be here. Um, yes, we're in the advising business, yes. uh, so we would, uh, we would be called pensions advisors. Mm -hmm. um, people may not think that they need advice in relation to their pension, but uh, it's a very complicated subject, actually. And uh, that's what we do for a living. You've we, been doing this for how long? We've been doing this for about 40 years now. Okay, so you know, you know a thing to do at this stage. Well, but we hope so, yes. Okay. And Paul, you were the uh, ombudsman of pensions for many for, years. For 13 years, yeah. Yes. Before that, I spent, what, 34 years in the actual industry itself. Did you start as, working at five, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm still working, yeah, with the Retirement Planning Council, this time at the... Uh, the end product stage, okay. uh, where we get people out safely. Okay, so you've seen a lot of change, obviously, I would imagine. In that a lot of change, a yeah. very great deal of change yeah. in the 50 plus years, yeah. yeah. All positive, I hope. <laughs> Mostly positive. Mostly positive. And uh, Mark, Royal London, uh, how long have you been in this kind of arena? You've been here for oh, a while. Yeah, I've been in the pensions industry now for well over 20 years. Yes. Working in various kind of product development roles with different financial services firms and joined Royal London, Ireland three years ago. And we're, we're looking to, I suppose, launch a pensions business in the not so distant future. Okay, fantastic. Okay, great. So I just want to um, talk, like, I mean, I suppose the biggest tips, if you were to give one tip, just one take home, even though we're just beginning the conversation, for people who are in mid to towards the end of their career, like one tip to approaching retirement, what would it be? Get a good advisor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a vested interest in that. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's just, it's a, it's a subject that really needs careful consideration. Okay. There are so many options at retirement age and so many things to take into consideration. Oh, I was planning for retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, you do need somebody who is actually in the business. We have, we have a great capability in our industry to make things very difficult mm -hmm. for ourselves. Uh, and for our clients. Mm -hmm. And uh, it does need careful attention and you do need specialist advice. Okay. So I would say to anybody uh, who is contemplating retirement or is even within five, 10 years of retirement, make sure you have a, a good advisor okay. uh, to help you along the way. Okay. Paul, would you... I, I, first of all, I, I agree totally uh, with Declan. You do need someone to bust the jargon because there's yeah. an awful lot of jargon around but uh, my advice to people is to make sure that they get their ducks in a row, that they get all the information they can, both on uh, the occupational pension side, but also on the social welfare side, which can be unbelievably complicated, mm -hmm. depending on your history. Okay. Um, so get that together and get it together well in advance of the day you've got to sign on. Okay, and from the, for the social welfare side of things, do you get that from an advisor or can you, can you get that from a government advisory board? Uh, no, most, most competent advisors will know uh, a lot about the social welfare system. It is very complicated, there's no <laughs> doubt about that. It has grown up piecemeal since 1953 yeah. and every time they tweak something, there's unforeseen consequences yes. somewhere else. Okay, sounds very Irish. <laughs> and Mark, uh, yourself? Yeah, I suppose the one piece of advice I'd give to people is, you know, it's never too late to start. Okay. Um, I think the older people get, they're probably the more afraid yeah. they are of having the conversation, but that's where, you know, the likes of Declan comes in, you know, okay. meet with an advisor, put a plan in place. Yes. Um, you know, and, and I think as both Paul and Declan have alluded to, it's a complex system. So, you know, you need the experts to help you navigate. Okay. So actually, that brings me on to my next question, uh, Declan. So I guess, as you were just saying there, Mark, people kind of get scared because they're going, I don't have enough money in the bank, you know, like I don't have enough money to, to retire. What is yeah. there? Is there a magic number that people need to have um, banked effectively or planned for to, to retire on? No, it's, a, it's extreme. That's, that's the one uh, issue is that it's very individual. Okay. And there are lots of numbers that you'll get bandied around within the industry. And there are limitations that are set down by revenue. Uh, how much you can have, how much you can put in. Uh, there's all sorts of criteria that you have to fulfill. Yeah. But at the end of the day, really it comes down to individuals deciding how much they, can, they need to live 
uh, going forward in the future. So putting together a good financial plan uh, is really the start of the, all of this exercise. Um, you really need to know how much income are you going to have? And as Paul alluded to earlier on, that incorporates the social welfare system. Mm -hmm. So they go hand in hand with the occupational pension scheme, social welfare and occupational pension. And you know that's what you need to grasp hold of. How much income do I need to survive on between uh, the time I retire uh, now that I've given up uh, earning any income? Mm -hmm. So to do a financial plan and get uh, a handle on where you are, uh, whether you have other assets, have you got properties, have you got rental incomes, have you got incomes from other sources, mm. uh, even down to your health. I mean, health mm. is hugely important. I mean, longevity. Are you a family man that has been, are you part of a family that's been living, you know, 30 years or 40 years beyond retirement age? Or are you a family that has suffered poor health? What is your prognosis? What, what are you likely to be? And if you can get a handle on those topics early on, it will give you a guideline as to where you have to go. But in all of this, there are limitations, uh, depending on your age, how much you can put in, whether you're working for a company, whether you're a director, whether you're a self-employed individual, mm. all have different criteria. And that's why I say legislation in this country doesn't make it easy for everybody. Okay. So um, the planning piece is, the first piece of the planning is your own financial plan. Okay, and um, Paul, do you think people overestimate or underestimate how much they need to live a year? I think, I think, I think they underestimate, and particularly okay. nowadays when we're talking about the cost of living day and daily. <laughs> yeah. um, you it's know, changing it, quite it, dramatically. It's, it's, it's changing literally as we speak, yes. you know. Uh, so it is very difficult for people to uh, to estimate. And I, I think it's very important that they have a, a very good picture of what they are likely to be able to expect from particularly social welfare, because, mm. you know, that can vary considerably. And I gather they're about to change the rules again now mm. um, yeah. uh, with the, the, the new um, promise of, of um, letting people enhance their pensions by retiring late. Um, but they're, they're certainly going to change the, the way uh, state pensions are actually uh, computed for mm. a lot of people. In terms of a contingency, do you think people should say, let's say I say, OK, I'm going to need 100 grand a year to keep my very extravagant lifestyle going. Do you think there's, people should say, OK, well, if you, if you require 100,000 euros, you should also have a 10 grand contingency. Would that be realistic or no? No, I, I think if, you, if you're going to need 100 grand a year, you're going to have to build up a fund on which you're going to pay so much tax yeah. at the end of the day that you wouldn't believe it. Okay. Um, so it, it's, it's difficult to build up uh, the sort of fund that would give you that kind of income okay. um, uh, under the rules that Declan talked about. Okay. Because there's lots and lots of different constraints in terms of tax relief and what you can build up before you have to start paying tax on the proceeds okay. and all of that. So it is very, very complicated. Okay. Quite simply there it is. Um, at the moment, if you were to go out and try and buy yourself a pension from an insurance company, and uh, Mike will, will, will attest to this, that, for example, if you gave an insurance company today in, in Ireland a million euro, yes. uh, that would probably produce for a male or a female somewhere in the region of about 45 to 47,000 euro per annum. That's it? That's it, mm -hmm. I'm afraid. Now that's before a lot of other contingencies that I haven't mentioned, and that doesn't include spouses, pensions being left behind and so on, yeah. or cost of living increases. I mean, the, 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 the rate at which they transfer money into a pension at this stage for a male and a female at around about 65 years of age yes. is about 4.6%. Okay. So uh, you have a long way to go to get to that 100,000 you were speaking about. Yeah. It, it's, it's very much related to the state of interest rates. So with interest yeah. rates at rock bottom, that yeah. means that it feeds into annuity rates and you get terrible annuity rates and you're locked into them for life. Okay, that really lost me. But Mark, you're going to give me some good news. Tell me about a case study you have of building a 800k pension for a 50 year old what do we need to do how did, how did, so, how did yeah, we work I mean, backwards uh, looking at someone maybe who's around the age of 50 mm -hmm. and you know maybe they're having that conversation that they think it's too late i suppose really it's it's not um, and if they're looking at targeting a fund of about 800,000 roughly by the age of say 66 or 67 okay. They're probably looking in at putting about 1,200 euro per month into their pension. Okay. And the 1,200 euro per month will, will get tax relief at yes. their highest rate of income tax. Um, and that will then look to, we look to maybe increase that to about 1,600 
once they reach the age of 60. Yeah. All things go into plan and, you know, I think assuming an investment return in around about 4%, you know, that, that puts them on track for a fund roughly around 800,000 by the age of 66, 67. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, which I suppose is, is, is probably a good size fund to target because under current rules, <coughs> you can take a, a maximum tax-free lump sum, a lifetime amount of 200,000, which is 25% of your 800,000 pot. Yes. So, you know, 800,000 is a good number to, to have in mind as a starting point. Uh, and again, sit down with, you know, the, the likes of Declan and, and put in place the plan to, I suppose, to kind of help you achieve that sum um, yeah. and what needs to be going in on a monthly basis to try and help you fund it. Okay. And in terms of changes, I mean, like even this week, we've, we've seen there's lots of changes, but in terms of other trends, like regulatory, technology, like what, what should people be aware of that could, could completely, you know, change all their plans. Yeah, I mean, I think over the last 18 months, we, we have seen a lot of change. One of the biggest was um, the implementation of an EU directive, the IORPS2 uh, uh, directive that was implemented into Irish law in April of last year. And really explain, that- Explain that a little bit to me, just to, if you can, in layman's language. So, I mean, it very much affects the occupational pension scheme market, and in particular trustees. Mm. And I suppose really it comes down to a lot of the rules and a lot of the governance that goes in and around pension schemes and that trustees now you know, are, are, are on the hook for, uh, and it, it really- How much are they on the hook for? <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a lot um, when it comes to things like policies and procedures, there's 10 different policies they have to have in place, and that could come down to things like risk management, audit functions, there's about 10 different procedures they now have to have in place. So, you know, it, it really has raised the bar in terms of, you know, wanting to be a trustee of a pension scheme yes. because of these very onerous requirements that have come in. Uh -huh. And, you know, so it's, it's <clears> something that people probably won't go into lightly, yes. and it's, it's probably you're going to very much see people, you know, turning to engage the services of professional trustee firms okay. so that, you know, they are complying with this. Um, you know, on the horizon then we have talk of auto-enrolment, you know, where yeah. people will be automatically enrolled into, um, you know, a kind of a state-run pension system and there's talk of having the framework for that mm -hmm. in place by the end of 2023 okay. um, with the first kind of cohort of employees um, being enrolled into that system in, probably in early 2024. Um, that soon, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, and then we've had other changes in and around, you know, kind of through last year's uh, Finance Act. We saw some changes implemented on foot of that. Um, so, you know, uh, as a landscape, there's, there's significant change out there at the moment, you know, and this is why I think it is important for people to sit down with advisors, you know, because things, are, things feel very fluid at the moment. Yes. in terms of this, the level of change I think the industry is facing into. And even only, you know, today we're, we're seeing obviously changes being mooted around the, the state pension. Yes. And okay. when people can access that or if people defer, you know, taking retirement that they might get a higher amount of state pension. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it, it just seems to be a, a real evolving landscape. And, and again, we're, we're, there, there's rumours that there could be changes in next week's budget as well <laughs> uh, on, the, on the pensions front. So, yeah, more change to contend with. Yeah, I just uh, noticed there that they're also going to consider what I have been advocating for for a long time, that if there's going to be flexibility beyond the current state pension aid between 66 and 70, that they're now going to consider supports for people who have to stop working in their early 60s. Yes. Uh, because that was the component that was missing, mm. the flexi flexibility component for people who haven't reached pension age yet, uh -huh. but still have to get out for reasons, uh, for different reasons. Actually, speaking of flexibility, you know, like obviously with the COVID in the last years, people, a lot of people have started working from home and so forth. Has that changed people's target date of retirement? Are they working? Do they, are they happier to work a bit longer because you can do it from home or, or do you, has it, I believe in COVID, people pull back the retirement age? We did a bit. survey actually among yeah. uh, people who are doing pre-retirement courses yes. and 25% uh, of people said that they would uh, want to retire later. Later? And 32% said they would want to retire earlier because oh, yeah. they got a taste of being home of course, and, yeah. you know, yeah. the, the flexibility that gave them and so on. But the people, ones who wanted to retire later said, well, hold on a second, if I only have to come in three days a week or two days a week and I can avoid the commute, um, too bad. Why, why wouldn't I work on a bit? Yes. So people have different attitudes, depending on their own personal circumstances, they have made different decisions about when they would ideally want to retire. Okay. Really, Liz, what was happening here is that Ireland is only just about catching up with the rest of the world uh, in, with regard to flexibility of pensions and the way they're operated. We have an incredibly complicated system here. Um, you know, generally speaking, the UK follow the Australians and the, we follow the UK and, and the rest of Europe now are, 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 are much more um, 
flexible than we've ever been. So but we're getting there. We're trying to get there, mm -hmm. I think. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things I think we've all been advocating for for years is uh, access to pensions and to the funds that people have built up at the important times of their life where they have education of children to, to contend with. Mm -hmm. They have mortgages yeah. to contend with. Mm -hmm. In other parts of the world, you are allowed uh, minimal access mm -hmm. uh, to some of the, your funds. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the flexibility issue of pensions in this country is being addressed piecemeal, bit by bit, and I just wish we could get on with it um, because it's, it's incredibly complicated. Yeah, I, know. I don't know whether it's still there, but uh, some years ago I heard about an arrangement in Canada whereby people could start putting away money for children on a tax relief basis, provided that the money would be used for educational mm. purposes mm. when the children got to that third level stage, yeah. which is a great idea. Mm. And if it wasn't used for education, it would go into a pension fund. Okay, yeah. okay so progressive forward thinking over there. Yeah. Always, they always seem to be kind of ahead of the curve. Um, in terms of, you were just talking about markets and like, you know, in Europe and stuff like that, what about like markets and performance and annuity rates? Well, performance, performance is obviously uh, very much key to a person's planning, mm -hmm. um, but it's the risk management side okay. of it. It's the risk piece. I think um, a lot of people are scared now, aren't they? After they the are. Crash. People are scared. I mean, last year, 2021 was a phenomenal year for <laughs> markets. It was just absolutely superb. But uh, all of us, we've all, uh, we've all given all that back this year. Yeah. So whatever gains were made last year are now being given back. The, the, the issue for somebody retiring and planning for retirement is, do they go and go to an insurance company and buy themselves a pension from yeah. that insurance company and pass the risk back to the insurer as opposed to taking the risk themselves? Mm -hmm. Or do they go down the route of investing the lump sum that they have and then drawing down on that themselves and having to manage that themselves now, to do that, you need to put risk on the table. Yeah. It's what level of risk have you got tolerance and have you got the capacity to take? And that has to be assessed. And that's all part of the process that one would go through with an advisor um, before uh, they, they make that decision. And is, is, is there an algorithm to this or is there instinct? No, the, the, combination? The, no it, it really is down in, very individualistic. I mean, what, uh, you know, what risk I might put, like to put on the table, the two lads here might put a completely different okay. uh, spin on it. Um, risk, to us in the industry, we sort of use this uh, scale called the ESME scale of risk. Okay. It's a scale of one to seven, mm -hmm. and it's a simplistic way of trying to advise people uh, of the, the, the tolerance, of the, the, the capacity that they have for taking risk. So one is the lowest level, seven is the highest level. Mm -hmm. Uh, we don't do seven, by the way. Uh, seven is the 2.30 in NACE. Um, <laughs> so we don't do seven. Uh, but we do six, and so we do all the way back to one. Okay. Uh, and one is the lowest level, as I say, six being the highest, which would, which would mean that you would have all of your funds mm -hmm. invested in the stock market. Okay. Now, that would be not... Uh, a lot of people are, are scared of doing that, yeah. particularly when they get to their early 60s or middle 60s. The last thing they want to have to do is put risk on the table. Yeah. But against that, if you give it to the insurance company, and this is, uh, <laughs> Mark might disagree with me, yeah. but if you give it to the insurance company, he, he's in the annuity business, yeah. um, I'm in the advising business, and different strokes for different folks. Okay. And that's really what it is. But there are options, and where you need the advice is on the option side. Okay. So mid-career, like let's say you're... 10 years out, five years out, what do we do to stay on track? Do people start throwing money into the bunch of funds at this point? Or, you know, is there, Paul, have you kind of seen a, is there, a, you know, a, not a profile, a kind of pattern that you see over and over? Uh, it depends, I suppose, on uh, where they are in their own individual life mm -hmm. cycle. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if the mortgage is kind of nearly paid off and that sort of thing, you maybe got more capacity to start throwing more money in. Yeah. And as age advances, the amount of the percentage of your pay that you can get tax relief on is increasing. Uh, so it becomes more attractive, more and more attractive mm -hmm. to put more money in. Uh, and at that stage, then going back to uh, what Declan said, it then depends very much on how you invest that money and how you intend to use the money at the end of the day may colour the way you invest the money. Okay. 
because if you're going to buy an annuity, if that's what your intent is, then yeah. you would be investing in a particular way, mainly in bonds and that sort of thing. If you're going to go for what we call an approved retirement fund, an ARF, which means that yeah. you're managing your own money post-retirement, then you'd be uh, perhaps in, in investing a bit more adventurously. Okay. What's the most growth. common option? What's the most common thing people go for in Ireland? Well, at, at, at the moment, I'd have to say um, the approved retirement ARS, fund that Paul just yeah. mentioned, it's, it's, it's commonly known as an ARF. Yeah. Effectively, what you're doing is you're putting a lump sum of money into another investment vehicle uh, that you've saved in the pension pot. You put, now put it into the uh, ARF at mm -hmm. retirement age and you manage that throughout your lifetime. There are minimums that you have to take out of that. Yeah. Um, you know, you must take out at least 4% per annum mm -hmm. until you get to your 71st birthday, but that then comes to 5%. Yeah. So if you're investing money and you have to give, you have to take 4% yeah. or you have to take 5%, well then, to take into account management charges, investment charges, you need to be getting at least another 1% on top of that. Okay. So you're looking at getting a return of either 5% or 6% as a minimum. And that requires, in this day and age, putting risk on the table. Okay. Uh, but the, 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 the nice thing about the ARF, uh, as opposed to the annuity, is if you've come to grips with the thought that you are going to take the ARF, you're also securing the money for your, your family because if you do happen to die, and let's face it, if you don't die pre-retirement, you're definitely going to die post-retirement. <laughs> okay. So um, if that happens, um, but yeah, when, whenever that happens, at least the money in the ARF is passed back to your estate. Okay. And it goes back to either your children or your yeah. surviving spouse. Yes. Um, in the annuity, uh, very often, you can buy an annuity for your spouse yes. uh, in the event of your death. Um, but it reduces the annuity that you get okay. up front. And in addition to that, if you don't, um, very often people can't afford to do that mm -hmm. with, with, the, with the way the cost of annuities are today. Mm -hmm. And it means that the uh, insurance company then would retain the assets and they don't go back to your estate. Okay. Now, in, that, in, that... in relation to the ARF, I should explain that yes. if you don't draw down your 4% or 5%, as the case may be, they tax you as if you had. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. So, you have so, to, you're so better it, off. it makes yeah. sense to yeah. draw it down. Yeah. 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 Okay, Mark, you have something to say there? Yeah, no, it's just, I mean, I think the ARF is, you know, more and more people now, you know, have it there as an option at yeah. retirement than, say, 10 or 15 years ago. And I think the flexibility gives, you know, that, you know, if you do die in retirement and you can pass on the residual pot of money to a yes. surviving spouse or the kids, it's, it's a very attractive option for yeah. people. Um, it does obviously, you know, come with having to put risk on the table and there's a bit more hands-on management uh, yes. in, in terms of, you know, managing the level of income you take from it, where it's invested. But, How much, uh, you say there's a bit more hands-on, like as, as per the person or as the advisor, who, who's, who's doing the, the hands-on work there? I think that it's, you know, it's again, it's a case of sitting down with an advisor because, you know, you, you've rolled over from a pre-retirement product. Yeah. You've gone down to a, a kind of a post-retirement product that's, you know, probably going to be invested. So, you know, an investment strategy is going to be obviously a key part of it, as is how much income you're going to have to draw down from it. And they like some of the points that Declan touched on. You know, that if you're drawing too much yes. or the funds aren't performing well, yeah. you can obviously run the fund down a lot quicker. So, you know, they're important considerations. And can you do pick a mix, bit of, bit of one, bit of the other? You could. Yeah. You could. And, and that would probably, your bets, probably <laughs> di dictate how you invest your money pre-retirement as well. Yes. You know, if that's the outcome that you want. The one thing I would say, and I always say this to the people who take our pre-retirement courses, is if you have an ARF, for God's sake, treat it in your will as if it was cash money. Really? Okay. Because although you can buy an annuity on a joint life basis so that it passes automatically to someone on your death, yes. that can't happen with an ARF. Mm. Okay. It has to be treated as if it was money in the bank. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You, sorry. Tell me about the retirement courses, just briefly. If you're, if you're, if you're, you, you run retirement courses. We run pre-retirement courses yeah. for people, and as I say, when I'm talking to them about making their will and that yeah. sort of thing, I say, if you have an ARF, for God's sake, look at it as if it was a bank account or as if it was cash, okay. and make sure you're leaving it where you want to leave it, okay. because otherwise it slides into the residue of your estate, which mm -hmm. you've left to the cats and dogs home okay. or whatever. We would very often as well is we would recommend people to go on on Paul's courses, yeah. uh, not just to come to us uh, for advice, but I think they should hear the other aspects of retirement, which are not all financial, by of the course, way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are other aspects to retirement which are very, very important. And you've just got to be comfortable with everything that you're doing. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think 
those courses are invaluable okay. uh, for people. Yeah. Okay. We talk about people, uh, to people about managing change. Mm. And uh, I remember I had a, a... I mean, this is a really important part of, like, everyone's, as you said, like, approaching retirement, preparing for retirement isn't just all about the money, it's about everything else that goes with it. Yeah, I, I, was, I was taking part in a pre-retirement course for one of the unions recently, and uh, there were 112 people at it. And uh, I said, hands up uh, anybody who's ever managed a transition. And about a dozen hands went up. And then I said, OK, I'll put it another way. Hands up anybody who ever got married. Loads of hands. Yeah. Had children. Loads of hands. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cha changed jobs. Loads of hands. Mm. Moved house. Loads of hands. Mm. So we've all had experience of managing these transitions without yeah. seeing them necessarily as yeah. such. But to remind people of that experience and the fact that they can manage and that it is something, it's not, a, a, retirement is not a single event. It's not like jumping off a cliff. <laughs> it is... Uh, something that is going to take time that you've got to adapt to the changes that take place yeah. and be conscious of them and, and uh, you know, roll with the punches but stay in control as much as you can okay. of the process. Yeah. Um, so our courses are designed to look at the kind of psychological piece, the emotional piece, yes. that sort of thing, uh, because it is important. It is a big event even though we call it a transition, it is yeah. for people an event. It's well, going to happen. Yeah. And it's, you know, they're, they're changing from paid employment to retirement. And it's a different situation. And it's 24-7-365. Yeah. I think in a way, as we mentioned briefly, uh, like COVID kind of gave people like, you know, an insight as to what life at home is like. Yes. You know, mm. what life in, in the pockets of everyone in your family or your partner is, is like. And as you said... Quite a lot of people loved it. Quite a lot of people hated it. So it, it was. Well, yeah, you know, I, it, it might be. It was kind of a, a good, you know, mirror as to what might happen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you've got one person at home and one person out full time work, I call the person retiring from full time work the space invader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> get out of my space. <laughs> um, so when we are like at, at retirement age, which at this stage we don't know what, what is a retirement age anymore. Yeah. It's changing every day. So let's say we're somewhere between 60 and 70, give at the moment. Uh, a year out, what, what is the best thing you could possibly do in that last year, if you're kind of thinking you're like in the last year to come? Well, it very much depends on what you've done in the previous yeah. 10, 15, 20 years. You know, mm -hmm. if you're in a panic and you haven't got there and you're going to feel, you know, you're short. Yes. Uh, I mean... You know, it's it's difficult, okay. but there are mechanisms that you can use for the, through the funding for pensions that are regulations that can be used, and, such as uh, such as you know putting in extra contributions depending on whether you're. It just depends on whether you're um, self-employed, you're an employed person, you're a company director. Mm -hmm. They're all different scenarios, and mm -hmm. I mean, it'll take too long to to discuss them all <laughs> here right now. But that's the complication of the of our okay. system. But, you know, one year out, I would suggest that, you know, what we just spoke about, Paul's course, I mean, that is vital at, yes. this, at that stage. Uh, I mean, you're about to go into this transition period, yeah. which is a big change in your life. The finances will take care of themselves. You either you have them or you don't have them. Yeah. And it's, a, it's, a, it's just a fact. As to what you're going to do with the finances if you do have them, well, there are a number of options, and that's what we do. But I do think that, uh, you know, the, the thing that one can do best is talk to other people. Talk to people who have experienced retirement age. If you can take the confidence of somebody that you have, either a friend or a neighbour or, or, you know, an ex-colleague mm -hmm. or somebody, it, it would be well worth sitting down and doing some research as to what they did. But a lot of this is covered in Paul's course. In your course, okay. Now, as I said, you either have the money at that stage or you don't. But what if money suddenly unexpectedly comes to you? Well, if yeah. money comes unexpectedly again, you're, you've limited. Well, you have limitations from the revenue again. I mean, if yeah. you're if you if you're on your own there and you're self-employed or you're a, a, an employee of a company, you know you've got to age sixty. I mean, you can put in forty yeah. percent of your total income and get tax relief on it. And I would say to people that the tax relief is something you need to take into very seriously yes. into account because it's massive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal between you and the, and, the, and the Irish government. They're giving you a massive opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if you don't use the tax system to your benefit, mm -hmm. you really are missing out. Um, so find out what those limitations are. And they're, they're, they're all age, all age related. With the exception of those who are directors of a company, mm -hmm. they have a different opportunity for putting money in. And it, it, it needs a, what's called a funding test okay. uh, to be done to see what they can put in. 
But, you know, that would be my thing. And, and, that, and certainly with a year to go, you need to up the ante, talk to someone like Paul, talk to the advisor, get as much information as possible. If there's scope for putting more money in, make sure you use the tax system to your advantage. And, mm -hmm. and more important, and equally as importantly, find out from the revenue, what stamps have you paid throughout your life and what is the benefit coming to you uh, down the track? Where do you find that out on the um, Ross? Or? No, well, you can get it uh, you, if, you have a, if you have a public services card, God bless the mark, yeah. you can actually yeah. open a MyGov ID verified account. Oh, yeah, I have one of them. And yeah. you, can pull mm -hmm. down, you can pull down your own PRSI yes. record and print yeah. it off. Yeah. And it's very important because particularly if your situation is complicated, if you've taken time out of the workforce mm -hmm. to rear children or care for people, yeah. if you have worked abroad, yeah. um, there's lots, of, lo lots and lots of information that you need. Yeah. And if you've worked abroad, you might have to uh, make your application for state pension a good bit in advance of state pension age so that our department can liaise with the social security okay. in the other countries to make sure that they've got all the information that they need. Um, Are all countries valid for that? Or no, like we, have, if you're we, in have, rules, and stuff like that, we have rules that cover the whole of the EU, EU and the yeah. European Economic Area and yeah. Switzerland. And then we have bilateral treaties with other countries, including okay. the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, mm. North Korea, and Japan. Of course, we'll all be um, working in North Korea. And, <laughs> and, and we, and we oh, sorry, South Korea, I meant. Yeah, I was thinking. <laughs> um, but, no, we're um, in agreement with North yeah, Korea. Yes, South, South Korea and Japan. And um, uh, we revived our treaty with, uh, with the UK after Brexit. What about, Brexit, uh, what about UAE? Brexit. I think Dubai, UAE, uh, all of those areas. Well, you see, what happens is that our department will apply to the other uh, Social Security mm. Authority, and if you're entitled to a pension them. from them, yeah. they will apply for that. But it's very, very important that you apply on time, because yes. we you will only, on time, you we will only like back your out? pension for six months. Okay. So if you're very late applying, you may lose some of your pension. Okay. And I know one fella, God bless him, who was late applying because he forgot how old he was. Ah, yeah. I always remember my mum being obsessed with the stamps. Make sure you get your stamps now. Yeah. Make sure you yeah. get your stamps no matter what you're doing. If you're not working, if you're maternity leave, whatever, get your stamps. Get very, your stamps. very important. <laughs> Was her thing. They, uh, they actually yeah. don't want you to make the application until yeah. at least three months. Three months. Right, okay. in advance. Yes. But the problem, as Paul says, if you don't apply on time and you miss the first number of payments, you're more than likely not going to receive them. So how, 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 far, how far in advance is it? Six months? Six months. Six months. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Mark, when we are, where we're, at, we're at retirement stage, what, what are our options? Lump sum, ARF? Deferring pension, you know, what happens when people hit, hit retirement? Yeah, stage? I mean, look, across nearly all pension types, you know, there's an entitlement to a tax free lump sum, and yeah. everybody likes tax free money. So, we all like tax -free money. you know, grab yeah. that with both hands. Again, the type of scheme that you're retiring out of might dictate whether it's 25% of your accumulated fund mm -hmm. or it could be up to a maximum of one and a half times your final salary at the point yeah. of retirement. So, once you've taken that tax free lump sum, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, that the maximum lifetime limit is 200,000. Um, so try and try and max out on that if possible. Because I'd be gone after two years. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so then look with the balance, you know, you're, if you've taken the 25%, you're more than likely going to invest the, the remainder of the fund into the ARF, yeah. the ARF. If you've taken the one and a half times final salary as your lump sum amount, you'd be looking at maybe buying an annuity with okay. that. Um, there's also the option, you know, if you've gone the 25% route, instead of putting the money into an ARF, you can actually in cash the remaining balance, obviously you'll pay tax and PRSI and USC at pretty much all the maximum rates, but mm -hmm. you know, there might be something unforeseen that you have to get your hands on some cash, okay. um, you know, for whatever reason. So that, that's an option for people. So, or, you know, some people may get to retirement age and, and, and look to defer their benefit, you know, yes. they, they may have other ventures, they might well, do other it, things. Because yeah, like, a lot um, of people do that, they hit retirement, they, they invest in something completely different, completely off, off track for their, their whole career. Under, under the current rules, yes. if you're over 66, you're actually exempt from PRSI, so you won't even pay PRSI yeah, yeah. on what you cash in. For now. For now. But we don't know if that's a bit like this is the well, here. How do, you, how do you predict these changes? Like, they're they're saying them. that the forthcoming budget is not going to make any changes to actual PRSI rates, but I don't know. Yes, but then they also said that's how we're going to pay for these extra, these exactly. extra yeah. contributions. Somebody so. has to pay the bill. Someone Somebody has to pay, pay. Yeah. Has to pick up the tab. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if I'm even allowed to ask this question. <laughs> what, what kind of pension do you have? Tell me what kind of pension do you have? Oh, the secret. That's the ah, secret. Go on. That's the secret. 
But no, um, well, you know, I, I haven't actually retired yet. Yeah, I know so, you don't. So. What, what are you planning on? What kind of uh, setup no. do you have? Uh, well, I mean, I have uh, an executive pension, yes. which I've been funding for many, many, many years. Yeah. Uh, and my intention is to transfer that, to take the tax free cash yeah. and transfer it into an ARF okay. at retirement age. Okay. So that's what and, you're going to do. And invest. Well, it is because I've been in the business for so long, yeah. I feel comfortable enough to be able to invest it myself okay. rather than having to rely on an insurance company to give me an annuity. <laughs> Okay. And I'd be happy enough to do that. <laughs> and if anybody, uh, if if you are, you yeah, <laughs> if you are comfortable to do that, um, that's great. You okay, know, but right. um, other people prefer to go the annuity route. Okay. Paul, are you going to give us your top secrets? Well, no. I mean, I I retired early from Mercer when I became pension ombudsman in two thousand and three. Yeah. And then I retired again in two thousand and sixteen. <laughs> Can you do that? Yeah. 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 Yes, okay. Of course. <laughs> So you have, do you have, what do you do? Do you have a combination of everything going on? I have do you? a combination of things, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Mark, you're obviously the, the baby of the panel here. Yeah, so so what, are you, what are you doing? I'm in the, in the Royal London Ireland uh, Employer Pension Scheme. Yeah, okay. And, you know, and again, there's contributions I make myself and there's contributions that the company makes. And, yeah. and I think, again, I, I'd say that to people that, you know, if you're, you're fortunate enough to work for an employer where there is a company contribution going in, yes. grab it with Take both it. hands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a great way to to help really kickstart that pension fund uh, yeah. and obviously throw in whatever you can yourself. Um, so like, you know, uh, employer pension schemes where the contributions we made are, are, are really valuable. Uh, Paul, this is a question, I'm sure, as we've mentioned, you cover this on your, your course a lot, but uh, I suppose a lot of people, again, coming up to retirement, um, they're like, I've just done nothing but work for my whole life, you know, yes. like, and I don't really have, I don't have golf, sailing, tennis, you know, is, volunteering, what, you know, hiking, you know, what, what do they yeah. do? Like, what advice do you it, give it's, to people? It's a funny thing because, um, you know, most people have some interest outside. Yes. Um, and golf is one of the things, um, uh, you forgive me now, um, uh, Declan, but um, I, I think golf is caused by a virus. <laughs> uh, you, you know, if you don't get the virus, you can't do it. <laughs> it's the same with uh, the different virus for bridge and yeah. walking to Camino de Santiago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're all caused by viruses. Um, but, um, you know, there's some viruses people don't catch, and yes. I didn't catch the golf virus. Yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah, catch the golf virus at all. Yeah. Um, but the thing is that um, to develop interests, uh, we very seldom get people who have no interest at all. But yeah. one time I had a farmer yes, who course, yeah. had done nothing but farm all his life, yes. and he had no interest at all. And he did our pre-retirement course, and his son bullied him into starting things yes and he took a course in baking bread and a general cooking course and then he took up yoga and hill walking and line dancing would you believe okay go on um, so there's lots and lots of things out there and there are hobbies that you can take up for example um like uh, landscape photography or uh now I, I would walk down the west pier in don yeah. uh, to try and catch fish and the bonus there is a 2k walk each way same applies to the Great South Wall at the, uh, at the, uh, the mouth of the Liffey. A long walk, might catch a mackerel at the end, but you have another long walk back. Yeah, okay. And that's the exercise component that's very important. Yeah. Because I would defend the golfers and I'd say that yeah. I would be out there for four and a half hours doing 18,000 steps uh, as opposed to walking down the pier. And don't need me. That's it? Yeah. Yes. I'm with Declan. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm okay. surrounded by golfers, obviously. I'm an anti-golfer <laughs> as well. But, yeah. but the, the whole point is to, to look at, to step back and look at what you're interested in. Look yes. at the things that um, fascinate you and look critically at what you're good at. Look at the things that you have been, uh, the knowledge that you've been accumulating all your life, all mm -hmm. your working life. Maybe you've done nothing but work. But you've got a lot up here that you have discovered in the course of your work, a lot of information that's out mm. there, a lot of skill that you've developed. Mm. Don't let it wither. Okay. Go out and find ways of using it. And there's lots of opportunities, for example, even if you don't take up part-time or sporadic employment, but to use your talents as a volunteer okay. to give a, a service to maybe a charity that mm. otherwise they might have to pay for. Yes. And there's charities out there that are looking for people all the time. Okay. I do a lot of work around Camden Street in Dublin, and there's five or six charity shops there. And um, the Irish Cancer Society has a sign up to say, can you spare three and a half hours a week? That's all they want okay. for you to work in their charity shop. Mm. Uh, but there's lots of other things that you could do for charities that will benefit them. And is there and a place yourself. we could go to find out this information? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of places. Um, one of the things, if you wanted, for example, to join the board of a charity is boardmatch.ie. You can go okay. there and they actually marry people who want to sit on boards yes. with uh, with um, non-profits that are looking for board members. Okay, yeah. 
Um, so there's lots and lots of things you can do um, like that that will help to fill the 24-7. The other thing, of course, is that when you are full-time retired, yes. there is a danger that people will assume that your time is theirs. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Now, and no, this is absolutely serious. Sounds you know, like because, motherhood, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's got nothing to do but sit on his hands all day. Okay, he can mind my dogs or my grandchildren or whatever it is. And, you know, that, that, that's a danger because people very I'm often... Very, get, I'm totally guilty of that with my dad. <laughs> <laughs> people get sucked into things, you know. Yeah. And I always say to people that if you're going to be part of a care plan, yes. you need to get into it on terms that you'll be able to live within a year's time or two years' yeah. time. Mm -hmm. And that's the danger that people assume... Yeah. that your time is available exclusively to them rather yeah. than to yourself. Because, because the, average, the average lifespan now, somebody retired at 65 is another 20 years. Yeah, and also like so, for, for me, for instance, like my children are young now and I, you know, childcare yeah. is a big issue. So yeah. grandparents are literally being roped in everywhere, every left, right and centre. They are. Yeah. You know? yeah. There's more grandparents at the school gates than there is parents. Every oh, yeah. Day. Yeah. 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 And when my granddaughters were off school and both parents happened to be working at a particular mm -hmm. time, we not only were into childcare, we were into uh, doggy daycare as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another level of commitment. Um, okay, what about, so ma men versus women, right? Coming up to the, the, re the retirement age. And as you say, we're all, you're all, you go straight into the golf and everything like that. I'm not saying women don't golf, but do, do you think men versus women approach retirement differently because women are used to being more involved in the community and, you know, more involved in families I, and so forth. I find as a matter of experience that women are better at keeping up their networks yes. than men. Yeah. Um, and uh, I know, you know, of situations where people who've retired from various walks of life and they have structures. Yeah. They have occasional barbecues or meetings or whatever. I know that um, uh, there's a group of retired social workers from a particular hospital who walk in Marley Park every Thursday. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. Yeah. It's, a, it, it's a structured thing. Yeah. And it means that they meet regularly. And um, I belong to two organisations. One is called the last Thursday of the month and the other is the first Thursday of the month. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the first Thursday of the month is anybody who ever worked in uh, Mercer or Irish Pensions Trust can go to a certain pub uh, for lunch on the first Thursday of the month. Okay. And the last Thursday is a group of people that were all in UCD together. Okay. And that's Sinison in uh, South King Street for lunch on the last Thursday of the month. Okay. So this is so just two piss-ups you have every yeah. month. Yeah. 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 But there are structures that you can develop like that <laughs> that will help to keep and expand your social network. you don't play golf. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no time. No <laughs> time. I guess as well with the likes of WhatsApp and everything, it's much easier now to keep all these groups going and so forth. Yeah. And well. actually, uh, yeah. some of these groups became WhatsApp groups during the lockdown. Yeah, they had course. to. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I know great to see um and in terms of um sorry last question now uh, <laughs> advice on managing your relationships at home oh yeah so i'm not sure i'm qualified to do really? that but anyway. <laughs> because, because it changes obviously you know as you said space invaders people are you know yeah. suddenly there yeah. a lot yeah sorry oh. we had a, we had a retirement book which we published back in 1997 or thereabouts and it was illustrated with a, 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 a sentence or a phrase from each chapter of the book. And we took a quirky look at each uh, sentence or phrase. And one of them that I remember well was called, retirement brings a lot more togetherness. <laughs> and this was illustrated by a fellow sitting at the kitchen table with the racing pages in his hand yeah. and a pile of cigarette butts in the ashtray and the wife standing at the cooker with steam coming out of the yeah. top of her head. Yeah. <laughs> so this is really important. Managing the space invader thing is yeah. very, very important because mm. if there's somebody who's been at home the whole time or a lot of the time and you're suddenly moving in on their space, you've got to realise that they have a life yes. and it may not be always, um, you know, a completely open book as far as you're concerned, mm. like the fellow who knew his wife was in a book club and didn't know it met in his house on a Thursday. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that came as a bit of a surprise. So he goes off and plays golf on a Thursday now. It's all about the golf. I suppose it's, it's, it depends on each individual circumstances. I mean, people are home alone. Some people are yeah. not. Some people have lots of grandchildren. You know, they have other commitments that they have. Um, it's very, it's very individu individualistic, I think. And it's just like managing the finances. I think you have to be on top of it. Um, so the moral of the story is get, get, get moving as soon as possible. It is. Get your plan in place. Mm. Talk to an advisor or one of the gentlemen from Pensions Awareness yeah. Week or, uh, or go to your 
your well, London's and so forth, and I have a chat yeah. too. Yeah. I think the important. I find it very overwhelming as a, yeah. as a female in this world. But you know, like, oh. you're, you're not going to enjoy retirement if you don't have some financial security. Yeah. yeah. So the message here really is get going on the pension funding as quick as possible. Yeah. And we would encourage people in their early 20s, if they can afford to do it while saving for for mortgages and everything Very else, to do it. But, yeah. you know, yeah. you've got to get in there. I mean, it's it's not, to, as Mark said, it's not too late at 50. Yes. But it's never too early either. Okay. Yeah. And uh, like if, you, if you start in your 20s, you're certainly not having to put in 1,200 euro a month. Yeah. No. yeah that's you know, that's maybe 100 euro a month. You know, and and the, the, the earliest money you put in is going to be the hardest working if yeah. it's properly yeah. invested. Yeah. And you know, if, if you don't have that money there, you're not going to enjoy all the things Paul is talking about. Yes, yeah. exactly. They're not but, going to be available to you. So you've but the other to... thing to remember is that you, there's, there's, there's discounts out there. They're after the grey euro. Yeah, yeah. They'll give you discounts on gym membership if you're able to go yeah. during the middle of the day rather than at either end. <laughs> They'll give you discounts for going to the Abbey Theatre and various cinemas. Um, there's lots and lots of things out there that will give you uh, discounts if you shop around. And always remember that you don't have to travel to the ends of the earth if travel is what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Every single day, we pass places that other people are coming for miles to see mm -hmm. and that we never bother with. Mm -hmm. yeah. And half them are free. Well, that's true. And you get free transport. Free and transport. And you, can bring, and you can bring a buddy with you. That's yep. right. Yeah. And there's lots of other things. So it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time, yeah, exactly. Um, so in terms of resources, so we've mentioned, uh, what is, what's the, for your, to register for one of your courses, for instance, how, how do we go about doing that? Well, uh, you, can, you can book online on yeah. rpc.ie. Yeah. Um, how much does it cost? Pardon? Is it free or does it cost? No, no, it's a, it, 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 there, there, there is a fee scale. There are different scales depending on whether you're doing a very expensive or quite expensive one-to-one -one course where yeah. there's only yourself and maybe your spouse. Okay. Uh, and then there's uh, group courses that we have as well that are uh, differently priced. Okay. And so the, the thing other, is to inquire yeah. with the office to find out what's going on. We have, we have open courses at least once a week, sometimes yes. twice a week in Dublin and in different parts of the country. Okay. Do you do lines. online as well or just as a We have been doing one? online. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we're currently doing online uh, right now okay. uh, as we speak. Okay. We're, we're doing online. Okay. And Mark, for yourself? So for the products that Royal London, Ireland will be bringing to market, they're available through independent uh, financial advisors, okay. such as Declan. Okay, um, and do you have uh, resources online as well for people? Yeah, I mean, we have information up available on our website, okay. hopefully from next week, okay. that people can look at things like retirement guides, you know, that again, just touches on some of the, you know, decisions that people have to make when they come to retirement and hopefully explain it in layman's terms and okay. make it easy to understand. Okay, and Declan, your website is? <coughs> ARF-pensions.com. Okay, and is there any other good resources, maybe even a book <coughs> or anything? Is there anything else that you find we, helpful? Well, we would have a retirement planning um, uh, brochure um, yeah. in our, in our, uh, our disposal and an investment um, yeah. uh, planning brochure at our disposal. Okay. And they're well worth um, uh, staying in some Tuesday dark Tuesday night in the yeah. middle of October and reading them. <laughs> okay. So uh, they are available from us at uh, the offices in Renala, mm -hmm. um, and the website is arf-pensions.com. Okay, and these will all be up on the Paul website yeah. as well. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. And thank you, Liz. you have thank a lovely you. afternoon and a wonderful retirement. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.